I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, sermonator, this morning. And uh, it's not often you get to introduce a real life hero, uh, but Zach Can is that. Uh, Zach and Cassidy uh, and the rest of the team that has participated in the work in Papua New Guinea have undertaken a remarkably difficult endeavor. Uh, navigating cultural changes, a move to the other side of the earth, uh, living in a very difficult place, uh, crashing through the barriers of multiple languages, uh, having spent six months preaching the gospel um, chronologically uh, through the Bible, leading up to the life and ministry and death and resurrection and ascension of Christ and the birth of the church, they got to witness the birth of a fledgling church in Maui Roro amongst the Doe people. And uh, amidst, at times, hostility, uh, amidst just what it means to be a sinner doing anything um, and working with other sinners doing any task, uh, but to do so in a very difficult place. And just to let you know about Zach, he, he is not enamored with some sort of romantic view of missions. Uh, he's not enamored with some uh, idealized view of living in a far off place that's exotic and exciting. And um, Zach is a realist and, and he works and labors every day in the mundane tasks. And, and I just wanna list out for you some of the mundane tasks that you recognize um, missionary work, if done right, is not about glitz and glamour, but about, as, as um, William Carey said, putting one foot in front of the other, plodding. <laughs> um, what does it mean to do the next thing? So uh, Zach, of course, has uh, learned pidgin, the, the trade language, in order to get into Do, the tribal language, and then uh, Zach and Cassidy and the team have worked to help the Do people learn to write their own language for the first time, read their own language for the first time. They've been writing uh, language primers to get there. Um, and then to begin to translate portions of scripture so as to teach it and see the church planted and believers discipled and then begin the arduous work of translating the Bible into dough. And so Zach is not home on vacation. Uh, Zach is being refreshed by time with the body. Uh, but even in the midst of that, he is laboring through translating Ephesians into dough. And it is long, hard, laborious work. Uh, just so you know, Zach has written the dough dictionary. <laughs> and the Doe Thesaurus, and the Doe Bible Dictionary, and the, <laughs> I mean, the whole list of resources that have to be in print for the knowledge and study of the scriptures uh, is the task ahead of them. So um, in a very real sense, and, 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 and Zach is humble enough to not get puffed up by my words here, uh, but he is a friend and, and a real hero. And uh, we're just so thankful for his work. I, I know uh, the ways that you pray for Zach and Cass and for the team. I know that you pray for the fledgling church in Maui Roro, and you will continue to do so. Um, but what you're about to hear is, uh, and I hope I don't totally undo your introduction, Zach. Um, what you're about to hear is, is the way Zach taught Genesis 6 to 8 to the Doe people. And it's all gonna be in Doe, so put on your seat. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, some of it will be in dough, right? Uh, very little. Okay, a little bit of it will be in dough, and then the rest in English. Zach, come on up. Thank you, brother. It's like an entire day's wage. So they spent an entire day's wage to call me. So I call him back and I'm just praying like, Lord, help me through this conversation. And I get on the phone and it's just small talk. I'm like, Zach, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, when are you guys thinking of coming back? Well, uh, the Mitchells hopefully are coming back soon and the 
cans. We're going to come home or come back, hopefully, in a few months, you know, sometime in 2022. And I'm like, so what, what's going on? He's like, well, let me check. And he starts calling to people in the village. He's like, hey, you, do you have anything you want to say to Zach? No? And you guys? And I realized they, they just miss us. And, and that was just such an encouragement. And, uh, you know, we've had this question, when are we going to get a preacher back into my Roro? And uh, the Mitchell family has been preparing to go. They've, uh, they had tickets a couple weeks ago to go back. But then Ryan got malaria, and they were delayed uh, a couple weeks. But Lord willing, the Mitchells are on a flight right now headed back. I think this morning, they, Lord willing, they were able to board a flight from Johannesburg. They're going to fly to D- Dubai. From Dubai, I think they head to Singapore. From Singapore, they head to uh, either Australia or straight into Papua New Guinea. They'll arrive hopefully sometime tomorrow. So maybe we can just pray for them uh, as they are journeying, journeying back to Papua New Guinea, uh, and we can pray for ourselves as we are about to read God's word. Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, you are great, and this whole mission is yours. God, all of us here, all of us on this planet, we are so new to the world stage. But God, you have been around forever. God, you were there at the beginning. You will be there at the end, sovereign, orchestrating all of world history. And God, here we are playing a small part by your Holy Spirit, by your beck and call. God, you've given us a job to do. And Lord, I pray for the Mitchell family as they travel now that you would just be gracious to them as they go through customs and checks and all the different requirements that um, the pandemic has brought to our world. God, I pray they would make it quickly and safely to Papua New Guinea. And God, I pray that the reunion with the Doe people would be really sweet as they welcome back a preacher of the word. And God, I pray that you would be with Ryan and his language abilities and his cultural understanding as he gets back into life in the village and sees what the needs of this baby, baby fledgling church are, that he would be able to care for them well. Lord, I thank you for the work you are doing in Papua New Guinea. God, thank you for what you are doing through our small organization, Finish Your Vision. God, thank you for Scott Maxwell and his leadership. God, thank you for Jeremy Lehman and his organization. Thank you for Cameron Dodd and her gifts in communication. God, thank you for equipping this body to send well um, friends and family to the ends of the earth. God, would you be with us now as we open your word and look at the end of the world as it's already happened in the days of Noah? God, would you... um, Teach us more about you. I ask this in your name. Amen. So one thing that has dramatically impressed me during my time in Maui Roro is that you actually cannot comprehend the gospel. You can't truly understand what good news is until you truly understand who God is. And, and I didn't say fully understand who God is, because I do not think that is possible. After an eternity, we will still be learning more and more about our great God and Savior. But the things we know about God, they have to be true things. And if we have a wrong view of God, inevitably that leads to wrong view of people and what our actual problem is. And if you have a wrong view there, that inevitably leads to just a wrong view of the gospel, a false gospel. You come up with other solutions to other problems. There is talk of God, a new to, they call him, all over the place in our village. But when we got there, no one actually knew who he is. They even say 
the Apostles' Creed in Tokpisin, in the, in the trade language there. Every Sunday, they say the Apostles' Creed, which is, as you know, if you've read it, full of amazing, glorious truth about God. We believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. And I asked them, okay, you say that. Who, who is he? Where is he? Tell me what he's like. And they say, well, God is like a, a good spirit. There's lots of bad spirits in the jungles out there. Lots of spirits down by the river, lots of spirits by the graveyard and in the various places around the village. You have to look out for them. But God, he's a good spirit. He's looking out for us. Some people believe that God is the one who's got all the stuff, all the things you might want. And if you can just figure out a way to make him happy or to put him in your debt, then somehow you'll get all of this stuff. It's basically just prosperity gospel with a tribal flavor. And, and because of this view of God, the Doe people do not have a right view of their greatest need. They think their greatest need is more development. I can't tell you how many people have come to my hut in the jungle asking me if I'm going to build a road someday so that trucks and cars can come and bring in materials and they can easier ship out all of their cash crops. They would love access to simple services, good things like education and healthcare. And these, these needs are real. They are very poor people. And their lives are very hard, but none of those things are their most pressing need. And so how do you, how do you address that? I mean, this is, the, this is my job, going in there, preaching God's word. How do you address these misconceptions of who God is? Uh, the way you do it, as you know, this is not going to be an, an earth-shattering answer for you probably, but you, you preach the word. And I have found that looking at Genesis has been one of the most helpful things in helping show the Doe people who God is. Helping them see who God was at the beginning of all things that he is the beginning of all things. So this is a, a sermon that I preached in a different language to a much smaller crowd about who God is, and specifically who God is at the end of the world. And I think this will be helpful for us as well. I mean, misconceptions of who God is are not unique to the village of Myroro. We have them here too. Um, we don't often think about God and his grandeur, who he actually is, that he sees everything, that we are responsible. I, I have friends who think that um, everybody gets saved, that a loving God could not possibly send anyone to hell, that everyone makes it in the end. Or so many who believe that somehow all religions, all beliefs, no matter what they are, they have some truth in them and all of them kind of lead to God if done properly. And if God is so generous and so welcoming, he becomes someone that we don't really need to consider. And therefore, our main issues become other things. I mean, think about the issues that pop up on your social media or on the news or that you're going to confront in the workplace Social inequality, racism, vaccination mandates, climate change, so many things that can become the big problem. Last Sunday night at a Q&A, there was a question about what do we do in a country that is falling apart and increasingly hostile to the gospel? What do we do? It's a good question. You can go listen to it. The pastors gave a good answer. But it does bring up lots of questions that we have. What is, what hope do we have? What, what hope do we have for our kids and our grandkids? What hope will you offer them? Is it that this country will last? Or that your freedoms will remain? 
or that your investments will pay off? Is that going to be your greatest comfort? Is that going to be your gospel that's going to get you through? I hope not. My aim today is to do the same thing that I did nine months ago in my Roro, and that is to preach on the story of Noah, to read the story of Noah and to look at what God did at the end of the world. It is amazing that God recorded a historical account of the end of the world. It's the end of the world in the past, and we can read about it. The end of the world really is the end of every earthly hope and dream. And then when you strip away everything that you know, I mean, strip away the world, there's nothing left. No carpet, no chairs, no building, no sky, no sun, nothing. It's just you and God. And knowing where we stand with God is undoubtedly our greatest need. Whether we live in Myroro or Tempe. So here we go. Let's open our Bibles to the very first book, the book of Genesis. We're going to be starting in chapter 5. Noah's story runs from the final verses of chapter 5 to the end of chapter 9. Uh, we're going to look at bits and portions of it, uh, both this week and next week. But we're going to start in chapter 5. God gave this narrative of the end of the world, the story of Noah, about a thousand years a little more than a thousand years after the event. So after the flood, this story is finally being told by the mouth of God to the Israelites through the pen of Moses. Um, and it's very clear from the opening chapter of the Bible that God aims to make himself known such that the people of Israel can begin to view themselves, God, the world, rightly. From the opening line, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and onwards, God is revealing who he is. In the beginning, God stands alone as the creator of everything, the one who brings everything else into existence. And at the end, God stands as the only judge worth fearing and the only savior worth trusting. How helpful this would have been for Israel as they were called to believe that God would care for them as they made the journey to the promised land. And how helpful these same truths will be for us as we are trusting God to bring us safely to himself. So as we work through these chapters, we're going to basically just ask a question. What is God doing at the end of the world? What did God do at the end of the world? We want to know who God is. This is a historical account of true events that actually happened. It's not a fairy tale with a moral. These are true events detailing what God did at the end of the world. So over the next two weeks, we're going to look at six things God did. He did more. I'm going to look at six. Uh, we'll look at three things this week and, Lord willing, three next. So let's start. Genesis chapter 5. I'll start reading in verse 28. So we're in a genealogy here. This is the first time Noah's name comes up. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech, were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Noah first appears in a list of names of Adam's descendants. And this genealogy in chapter 5 is a profound testimony of the fact that God keeps his promises. So the first thing that we see here in the story of Noah is that God kept his promises. Let me point out a few promises. You, they might not be clearly seen. You'd see them clear if you started in Genesis 1 and read through to Genesis 5. So I'm going to bring you back. Uh, we're going to look at, at a couple passages here. Uh, but first, before we leave here, look at verse 31. 
Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And he died. That phrase appears eight times in this chapter. In verse 5, Thus all the days Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Then down in verse 8, thus all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Verse 11, and all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died and so on and so forth. Eight times. And he died and he died and he died. So one of the things I got to ask the people in Myroro was, why, why do people die? It's, it's very normal for us. We're, we're used to it. We just assume, yes, everybody dies. We don't like to think about it. It's not pleasant, but everyone does. It's, it's just a reality. And why is it that way? Flip over to Genesis 3. You might not even have to flip. It's on just the other page in my Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we're going to look at some promises that God made. At this point in Scripture, I mean, we're only five chapters into the Bible. God has not made all the promises that he is going to make. God is going to make many, many, many wonderful promises throughout the Scriptures. He has not made many, but this, this is one of them that he has made. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, 17 to 19. This is the Lord, Yahweh, speaking to Adam at the fall. Adam and Eve have disobeyed God, eaten the fruit that God said not to eat. And this is a promise that God makes to Adam. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. That's foreboding. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. God says mankind is going to die and return to the earth from whence they came. And chapter 5 is all about showing that happen. Adam lived for a long time, a really long time, 930 years, but then he died. This wasn't a murder like Cain of Abel. This is just Adam dying. He returned to the dust, just like God said. And Lamech lived a long time, 700 and. 77 years, but then he too died and returned to the ground. God is not a liar. He tells the truth, and not just about death. The ground is also cursed, just as the Lord said. People are not only dying, but their lives are hard and full of pain. Look again at Lamech's words. So Lamech called his son Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech's life was hard and painful. His work was exactly as God said it would be. It was full of sweat, full of thorns. And the people in our village, they understand this really well. They're farmers. They farm these giant gardens on massive mountainsides. They know what thorns and thistles are. They've got this plant. Um, I, I, I don't even really know how to describe it other than maybe like some kind of poison ivy. Um, if you touch this plant, it is incredibly painful. Um, just pain, no like sores or anything, but you can go sleepless for days if you touch this thing. Um, But even so, our lives are a lot more cushioned than theirs. But even so, we can understand that life is hard. Can't you? I mean, just think of your life and the problems you have, the stresses you have, the challenges you face. Life is hard. And sometimes we're tempted to think that life is easier elsewhere. 
somewhere else or maybe another time, like maybe back in the days of Noah. Maybe if you go all the way back thousands of years to Lamech, you'll find someone who's got an easy life. Or maybe we're tempted to just look back to a decade ago and be, oh man, that was, life was so much easier back then. It's getting harder now. We should take the words of Solomon seriously when he says in Ecclesiastes 7.10, Say not, why were the former days better than these? It's not from wisdom that you ask this. Life is hard in every age because God made it that way. He keeps his promises. So if your life is hard, nothing strange is happening to you. God is trustworthy. He's keeping his word and so when you see that life is painful, don't fret, rejoice. Because God keeping his word is actually the grounds for the best news in the world. There's another promise here that can be seen in these verses. Don't know if you saw it. Thus far, we've seen how God keeps his curses. If he promises judgment, he keeps that promise. In Genesis chapter 3, God curses two things. The serpent and the ground. And ultimately, both of those things perish. We'll, we'll look at Revelation 20 at some point, probably next week. Both of those things perish. There's no hope for them, but there is hope for mankind. Look again at Genesis 3, starting in verse 14. This is God speaking to the serpent, the devil. Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, hostility, between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God promises the serpent. This is a promise directed at the serpent. That he will be crushed by a seed, a descendant of the woman. A child is coming that will destroy the serpent. And so Adam and Eve are actually expecting this child. In Genesis 4, verse 1, Eve has a son and declares, th thanks the Lord for this boy from Yahweh. Maybe this is the one who will rescue us from this curse that we have found ourselves in. But as we know, he turns out to be a murderer kills his brother. And now here again at the birth of Noah, his dad says, maybe this will be the one who will bring relief. May this be the one. May it be him who brings us relief. Candidate after candidate for crushing the snake has come and gone. Even faithful Enoch, who we didn't read in chapter 5, um, really amazing. Enoch is the only person in that genealogy who doesn't die because he walks with God. But even faithful Enoch was taken instead of sent to help. And so the Bible keeps tracking genealogies from Adam all the way to Jesus. And this is something you can test out as you read your Bibles. I think the primary reason, not necessarily the sole reason, but the primary reason for the genealogies in your Bible is to track the promises of God from Adam to Jesus seeking this promised one. It is interesting to note that after Jesus, the genealogies of the Bible, they come to an end. We can stop looking for the promised one because the promised one has come. God kept his promise. So in the days of Noah, God kept his promises. And as we keep reading in Genesis, we're going to see something else Yahweh does at the end of the world in Noah's day. God assessed and condemned mankind. Let's read it in Genesis chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, 
the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then Yahweh said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and the birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In these verses, God assesses mankind. He assesses them. He looks at them and determines their condition. And based on that assessment, he condemns them. In this section, God makes two assessments of mankind. The first one, I think, is that the human race is not listening to God and his spirit. We see this in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. God assesses mankind, and the first thing, the first assessment is that mankind is not listening to God, not abiding with God, not searching for God. Yahweh says, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Some translations say, my spirit will not strive with man forever or contend with man forever. So if people are not listening to God, if they're not listening to his striving with them, if they're not abiding with him, one thing we can be certain about is this abiding is not an indwelling. If, if abide is the best translation, it's God is just there. He hasn't left this planet off to do its own thing. He's there. People just aren't listening to him. And so if people are not listening to God and his spirit, then who are they listening to? Mankind is listening to spirits other than the Spirit of God. Now, the context here is indeed a little difficult. What's going on with the sons of God, the Nephilim, the mighty men? This gets at another question, actually, that was asked on Sunday night. And during that Q&A, Smed said, I would clear this up for you. I probably won't. But let me offer you an interpretation to test out. Man is increasing on the earth. And instead of listening to God, they're increasingly like Cain. Just sinning. God warns him, Cain, don't. Sin's crouching at the door. It's desires to rule over you. And Cain just doesn't listen. Not listening to God. Doing his own thing. Man is increasingly like that. Far from listening to God and having fellowship and abiding with God, mankind is more in harmony with Satan and his cohort. And Satan and his demons are far more interested in man's destruction than his survival. Because Satan, after all, knows this, that God said a seed of the woman is coming to crush his head. That's a fatal blow. And so this opening scene in Genesis 6 is one of all-out rebellion against God. Human rebellion and demonic. The union of the daughters of men and these sons of God produce offspring that are remarkable in strength and stature. They are renown. In Doe, we translated these men of renown this way. That means these children, these offspring, were very tall people with bones. 
which is how do people communicate strength. And so, because of these qualities, the people of that time lifted up their names. And when I taught this, I showed that these people are fearful, and the people of the earth fear these mighty men. But God is not afraid of them. God is not in awe of them. He sets a date to destroy them. And when he does bring about his judgment, they all perish. They are flesh. God sees and assesses all that is going on and says that his striving, his sustaining, his helping man will come to an end. But not right away. 120 years. It's a long time. God is patient. In his anger, he does not act quickly. In the midst of great rebellion, he's not intimidated. He's not backed into a corner. He sets a firm date, 120 years, and it's coming to an end. And then he waits because he has a rescue planned, which we will get to in a moment. But lest we think that mankind is off the hook because there is demonic rebellion here. It's Satan and his cohort. Those are the evil ones, not mankind. Or it's not all of mankind. It's just a group of them. The next assessment invalidates that thought. The Lord sees the wickedness of mankind. This is verses 5 to 7. The Lord sees the wickedness of mankind, not just their rebellion, but their evil deeds, their evil thoughts, their evil intentions. God not only knows what they did, he knows why they did it, what they were intending. He even knows what they were thinking of doing and never did. Earthly judges that we know cannot do this kind of assessing. All we can assess on earth, if you find yourself to be an earthly judge, all you can judge is the evidence that you have before you. Whatever evidence you can procure, God has all the evidence, all of it. He knows everything. He is not fooled by any lie. He's not blinded by any scheme or any darkness. And mankind, people, are not off the hook for keeping their evil thoughts to themselves. God knows everything. And he is sorry he made man because of mankind's rebellion. His assessment is correct, his response proper, his judgment just, and his judgment is this. He's going to blot out all mankind and the world that he inhabits. That's bad news. And before we move on to the good news, I want us to pause and consider. We're only six chapters deep into our Bibles. When this account was first read, Solomon was not yet around to write, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 1.7. And Jesus had not yet walked the earth and proclaimed, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. At a time when these voices have not yet been heard, that truth can still be seen loud and clear. God is a righteous judge. And the point is just crystal clear. Fear God, not demons, Nephilim, or any other mighty man. Fear God, fear Yahweh. And in the midst of this horrible assessment and condemnation and impending wrath, there is a ray of hope in verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Yahweh, at the end of the world, provided a rescue. The preservation of life, people, and animals floating around in a giant box is the focus of this story. More ink is spilled in the details of the rescue than on the judgment, even though God only saves eight people out of the millions, if not billions, of people who were alive at this time. 
the rescue is important. And before we read the details, let me just state something that's not spelled out explicitly in this story, but should be obvious if we are reading our Bibles from cover to cover. The first thing to say about this rescue is that this rescue had to happen. It had to happen. And not because Noah, his family, or the animals were worthy of salvation. This rescue had to happen because God made a promise. He promised that a seed of the woman would come to crush the serpent. And God keeps his word. So either Noah had to be the rescuer, the seed of the woman who crushes the serpent, or someone's got to be saved from the coming judgment. Because a seed of the woman, a descendant of the woman, has to come and deal with Satan. And God keeps his word. I took a quick peek at a children's book that we have out at our uh, book table, Noah and the Very Big Boat. I, I'm always curious how, how people tell the story of Noah to their, to their kids. Uh, most, most stories get at least that God saved Noah. Some kind of skip over the judgment, and, and some books don't, don't quite get it right as far as why was Noah saved? Is he a good guy? Did he deserve to be saved? Uh, they're not clear on those details. Uh, I took a look at this book, and this book is amazing. Let me just show you the last page. I, I was, as I was prepping this sermon, I was, I was looking at this book, and, and some guys from the seminary came up to me, and they're like, oh, doing some deep study there, Zach. <laughs> uh, it is deep, actually. Remember that God always, always, always keeps his promises. It's the last page of that book. Do your kids believe that? Do you believe that? That God always, always, always keeps his promises. God saved Noah so that he could send his son Born of a woman 2,500 years later, God gets all the glory for this rescue. But it is interesting to note who God saves in this story. He doesn't just pick one man at random, like eeny, meeny, miny, mo. He favors Noah. Why? Why Noah? Let's keep reading. Genesis 6. Start, we'll start again in verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation, Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. In a world where no one listens to God, where people are in cahoots with the devil and his cohort, where everyone loved doing evil, planning evil, thinking about evil, dwelling on evil, Noah stood alone. He couldn't be blamed for those same things. Look at how the verses describing Noah and his sons are sandwiched between verses describing God's intense displeasure with the wickedness of the world. In that context, Noah stood out. Just like Enoch before him, Noah walked with God. And this does not mean Noah is perfect or was perfect. He is perfect now, I guess, with his Savior. But Noah wasn't perfect. There are stories in your Bible of Noah being imperfect. Read Genesis chapter 9. Read God's assessment. We will read God's assessment of Noah at the end of chapter 8. But Noah walked with God. 
And what this walking with God looks like, um, we, we, get a, we get to see a picture of it in the verses that follow, in God's interaction with Noah in the rest of chapter 6 and going on into chapter 7. So let's keep reading. Verse 13. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark. Finish it to a cubit above and set the door in the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into, shall come in to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did all this. He did all that God commanded him. Then Yahweh said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate. And seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. Verse 5, and Noah did all that Yahweh had commanded him. When God said, Noah... I'm going to destroy the world, and you, my friend, need to build a boat. Noah believed that God was telling the truth, and he built a boat. This passage, by the way, was incredibly helpful in coming up with a term for belief in the Doe language coming up with an expression, because they don't have a word for believe in dough. They don't even have a word for trust. I mean, those are abstract concepts. I'm like, what if a guy steals your stuff? You know, you, you entrust him to take your crops to the beach, and he takes them and sells them to someone else and doesn't give you the money back. Are you going to give him your crops the next time? Like, what would you tell them? Won't you say, this is how I try to learn language. Uh, what would you say? Would you say, I don't trust you? They're like, no, I'm just going to tell them I'm not going to give them my crops the next time. (laughs) And I'm like, that's wise, but I still don't have a word to use yet. Um, God's word is just so helpful in defining terms. I mean, we use terms like believe. I believe in Jesus. Do you even know what that means? Like, have you honestly thought, what does that mean to believe in Jesus? Does it, does it mean you said a prayer at one time, signed a card? Does it mean that you've read your Bible a couple times, that you know that Jesus is out there? What does believe mean? And in this story, the word belief, uh, at least in chapter 6, I, I don't think it even shows up. But the reality of belief is all over the place. Noah hears God's word, and and this whole conversation, by the way, is very one-sided. It's God telling Noah stuff and Noah listening. And Noah hears God's word and thinks, this word is true, and therefore goes and follows God's instructions and builds a boat. And this actually turned turned out to be our very first phrase for belief. Sounds like this. 
Yahweh ko yuka yini, Noah ingoni hamong tini yuka ngu hawaro. So now, if anyone asks, do they speak in tongues at Grace Bible Church? <laughs> you can say yes. And there's an interpretation. So here it is. <laughs> Yahweh spoke a talk. Noah heard that talk and thought it's true. And that talk he followed. And... and we, we've found other ways to express this idea of belief since then, but that is really helpful. The, the obedience is not the faith. I don't want you to think that Noah is righteous because he did everything that was righteous. Noah believed, but the fruit of that belief, the fruit of believing, if you actually believe, if God tells you the world's going to end, build a boat, and you're like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, God. I know you'll save me somehow then you're not actually believing what God said. God said, I'm going to destroy the world. Believe it. And Noah believed it. I think God's telling the truth. And he built a boat. And it was not Noah alone who obeyed God. Look at uh, Genesis 7. Start reading in verse 13. On that very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in, as God had commanded him, Noah. So God commanded Noah, and then there were some who listened. Noah's family and the animals entered the ark too because of God's word to Noah. Of all the people that were on earth, the millions, maybe billions at that time, of all the people that were on earth, only Noah's family believed that old Noah was telling the truth about what God had said. Over in 2 Peter 2.5, you don't have to turn there, the apostle Peter writes that God preserved Noah, who was a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the earth, upon the world of the ungodly. So Noah was a herald of the right thing to do, which was get in the ark. It's the right thing to do. Agree with God, get in the ark. But most people just kept on doing what they were doing, kept on partying, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, as if nothing was wrong until the flood came and swept them away. Only seven people, Noah, Noah's wife, or eight people, Noah, Noah's wife, three sons and their wives. Uh, only they went into the ark. Only Noah's family listened to him. And God saved them. His rescue was not flawed. God knows how to save those who believe his word. He knows how to save. I mean, look at all the details we just read. He knew how to build the ark. Even in one short chapter, God tells Noah what materials to get. You're going to need some gopher wood and some pitch. He gives him the dimensions, all in cubits. And if a cubit is about a foot and a half, then you end up with a 450-foot long boat, 75 feet across, 45 feet tall. Gives instructions about where to put windows and a door, how many levels to build. Tells him to store up food. There are going to be many mouths to feed over the coming days. I mean, Noah might not even know how long this whole episode is going to last, but God knows and tells him to prepare for it. God has Noah bring in even more clean animals. I don't know if you noticed that in verse 7. We always hear the two by two go into the ark, but then there's a very special category of bringing seven of all the clean animals. Uh, clean animals talking about ceremonial cleanness. God knows that there's going to be a need for future sacrifices from Noah's day forward. 
There's going to be a need for blood to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. There's going to be a need for the sacrificial system that will be a picture, a sacrificial system with sacrificial system with lambs being slaughtered that's a picture of the Lamb of God who will eventually come to take away the sins of the world. God is omniscient. He knows everything, and he knows how to prepare. He knows exactly what Noah is about to face, and he is exceedingly wise, and therefore provides Noah with the instruction he needs to survive the coming judgment. And then when everything is ready, the ark is made, the time has come, God seals the fate of those inside and outside the ark. Look at the very last sentence. I didn't read it yet. The very last sentence in 7.16. Genesis 7, verse 16. And Yahweh shut him in. Yahweh closed the door and kept Noah and those with him separate from the rest of the world. He protected them while every other living thing on land perished. God knows how to save his own and does so perfectly. He makes no mistakes. And he also, in this same act, knows how to punish the wicked and to judge them. And we're going to learn, and we're going to look at that judgment and more of what follows next week. Uh, I think this is actually a really helpful place to pause in Noah's narrative. Because it is perhaps the most applicable point on the timeline to us. We are waiting for a coming judgment. And it has not come yet. But it is coming. In the last moments we have, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. One of my favorite things to do with the the people in our village is to show them how the Bible interprets itself. What lessons are we supposed to learn from Noah and the flood? The Bible is really instructive in helping us know. And 2 Peter 3 is a helpful lesson that Peter gives <clears throat> on something we can learn from Noah. 2 Peter 3, let's start reading in verse 1. Peter writes, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers, that's people who ridicule the truth, scoffers are going to come in the last day scoffing, ridiculing the truth, following their own sinful desires, and they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are just continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In wanting to think that way, they overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. The Lord has judged before, and he will do so again. Verse 8, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So basically, God does not reckon time the way we do. To us, he might seem delayed. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. But we have to remember, he may take a thousand years to accomplish a single day's work. Or he might accomplish a thousand years of work in a single day. God is not bound by time like we are. So what is God doing? Verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, 
but that all should reach repentance. The Lord waited in the days of Noah, and he is waiting patiently now. And notice what the opposite of perishing is in these verses. God is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What's the opposite of perishing in this verse? Reaching repentance. Reaching that point where our hearts and our minds are changed and we agree with God. We agree that he is telling the truth. Replacing whatever small, wrong views of God we had with robust, real, true, right ones. Replacing whatever grand thoughts we had of ourselves and replacing them with true, humble ones. And replacing our old hopes, which were really no hope at all, given the end of the world, with true hope. And the true hope is no different for us than it was for Lamech and Noah. It was the truth they were looking for, that God would keep his promise and send a savior who would deal with Satan and sin and bring blessing and hope to those who would trust in the Lord Jesus. God kept his promise. Jesus, the son of God, came and took the wrath of God so that anyone who believes will have peace with God will be reconciled to God. Anyone who believes, anyone who hears God's word says, yes, that is true and follows after Jesus, those are the ones who escape the judgment that is coming. The end of the world is bad news for those who love the world and the things in the world, but the end of the world ought to be a comfort and encouragement for those who are believing in Christ. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Genesis. These familiar stories which are so rich with truth for us. God, I thank you that you are keeping your promises. God, this world holds no true hope for us. God, everything in this world is going away. But God, we who love your son, we have such hope, God, that there is a day coming when we will be with you, where we will either die, fall asleep, and go to be with you, or you will come and we will be taken to you. God, there is a day coming when we will be with you forever and ever, and that is going to be a very, very good day. Oh God, I pray for those who have heard your word. I pray that for those who do not trust in your son yet, that they would repent, that they would change their minds, that you would change their hearts so that they might hear your word and believe that it's true and turn and follow you. God, would you do that miracle in their hearts? And for those of us who do believe God, would you just encourage us in our walk? May we honor you with how we go out and live our lives until you come. Amen.